You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Steeter. They are unanimous in their hate for me. And I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday. October 1st, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, the editor of Current Affairs, Nathan J. Robinson, on how we know Kavanaugh is lying. Meanwhile, surprise! The FBI Kavanaugh inquiry is a sham. White House has decided it will be extremely limited in its scope and depth. The question now is, for how long can Jeff Flake et al. pretend not to realize that? Meanwhile, new NAFTA deal signed. As far as we can tell, basically the same as the old NAFTA deal. But what is new is California's new net neutrality law and the Department of Justice lawsuit filed to stop it. Meanwhile, Rebecca Mitchell's final offense. As the Maricopa prosecutor tries to redeem herself in Republican circles. Did you call her a Rameka? Because I like that. Rameka Mitchell? Yeah, like, meh. Rameka. Meh. Yeah, no. But, yeah. The Supreme Court case, which could save Donald Trump. And just a reminder, we're now holding 13,000 children moving them around in the dead of the night because it makes for a lot less compelling video. And Crystal Mason heads to prison for casting a vote that was never counted. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, Ted Leo version of Pressure Drop. Thanks, we have some Ted. other songs that are uh, coming in. And uh, we will um, try and, you know, cycle through some of them. Some of them, you know, the pacing of the songs, e- even even the pressure drop version uh, from Ted, it's hard for me to get used to because like a Pavlovian dog for now. I mean, it, the pressure drop used on the Sam Cedar show nine to noon. So we're talking about nine or 10 years of, of, of essentially of training to, to jump and to react at certain notes uh, in that song. But I, I got it today. I, today I, I timed it. You well. sounded good over that first lick. That's when it just, it's a little bit tougher. I, Cause it's interesting. I, I'd have to go back to find out like what fired that synapse in my brain that said, okay, now's the time to talk. But uh, so if the, if the, the point being, if the pace of what you sent in is a little bit um, slower, then um, I don't know if we can use it because it will, I will, I'll, I'll have some type of uh, breakdown. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder this week, uh, I will be headed to, Las Vegas, Nevada, for the uh, tort conference that I go to talk to lawyers there involved in uh, lawsuits. Um, 
it will not be a dramatic difference in terms of our programming uh, week, however. But uh, just make sure you tune to that. People like those uh, shows from uh, from Vegas, and I always find it interesting to talk to these lawyers. And to a large extent, you know, like one of the things I'm hopefully going to track down one more. I'm not convinced that there aren't civil courses that can be followed if if so desired on on what would otherwise be criminal charges that we have seen involving Brett Kavanaugh. Wrongful death, you know, you, you see those in the context of, let's say, the O.J. Simpson uh, case. I don't know what the equivalent would be, but uh, I'm going to be around a lot of lawyers, so I will ask them. Um, just a reminder, folks, this show relies on its members for its support. You can become a member uh, today at Join the Majority Report. And I might as well, let me do this one first. Um. If you watched Chris Hayes Thursday night, you saw the first appearance that I ever did on um, on MSNBC. Well, it's not. I guess I, I've only been using Harry's for a couple of years, but un, the first unshaven appearance that I've ever had on MSNBC, and it was after the eight de- hours of broadcasting, uh, the hearings, and then I had to record something for Ring of Fire, and then I. Went into the bathroom. I'm like, I've got, I've got to shave. I have literally 30 seconds to do it. And I started, I had the Harry's razor and I started and I did part of the cheek. And then I'm like, this is a mistake. I can't shave this quickly. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do this. And so I just shaved the, you know, I have no idea how to sculpt a beard. Um, so I just shaved right here and here and then ran out the door. And um, I took a lot of grief from it. In fact, I heard from my Uncle Eddie and Aunt Carol that the Ori's who lived down the street sent them a, an email saying Sam should shave when he goes on television. That's the depth of how people are invested in my Harry's razor. Do they know Harry? Like, what's going on here? I don't know. But Harry's founders know that a great shave comes down to, to, to great blades. Made with sharp, durable steel that lasts. That's why they make some of the highest quality blades in the world, priced much lower than the leading brand. And they will even give you a full refund if you don't love your shave, as long as you let them know within 30 days. Harry stands behind the quality of their blades. So they created a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. Weighted ergonomic handle, five-blade razor with lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, travel blade cover. Claim yours by going to harrys.com slash majority report. You know what I love about Harry's? Reasonably priced. Sort of like a little bit fancy. The handle is uh, well sculpted. I happen to have the chrome one. I like that. And then they give you shaving cream and the whole thing. And, uh, you know, the narrow blade is important because of my uh, the asymmetry between my nostrils. And now our listeners can redeem their trial set at harrys.com slash majority report. Make sure you go to harrys.com slash majority report to redeem your offer, ladies and gentlemen. It's a good deal. Check it out. Let them know I sent you to help support the show. Okay. So the premise of why I wanted to have uh, Nathan Robinson on to talk about the many ways in which we know Brett Kavanaugh is lying uh, basically goes to that concept that Blumenthal introduced, the Latin phrase that means false in one thing, false in all things. And if you have a federal judge, I mean, put aside for a moment, like he doesn't quite have the temperament. That you might want from a federal judge. Not quite. You also might Maybe not off, want yeah. a federal judge on there who is literally blaming the Clintons. No, you are. For. You for, are. <laughs> for, I don't know. Do you blame I mean, the Clintons? It, I mean, to blame the Clintons for Blasey Ford is deep end territory. Got to get Blasey Ford on that. Just the same guy that's I mean, pushing around the Vince Foster. It's really Have nuts. Blasey, Blasey Ford. It's really nuts. And that seems to me to be uh, contrary to the temperament you might want for a uh, justice on the highest court in the land. But because the Senate is such an incredibly undemocratic place, 
Let's tune in to the two people, I guess, to get to decide everything. That is Jeff Flake and Chris Coons. Chris Coons, incidentally, the guy who says, like, if we take back the Senate, we should really reinstitute institute the filibuster. Just to give you a sense of just sort of how rarefied the air that these two must breathe, that they think, uh, 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 let's just play this. They're on 60 Minutes. Brought forward. If Judge Kavanaugh is shown to have lied to the committee, nomination's over. Oh, yes. I would think so. Yes, I would think so. Well, then I've got good news, everybody. Uh, You should send today's podcast to Jeff Flake and uh, Chris Coons because maybe they haven't figured this out uh, themselves. Uh, Jeff Flake responded to the word shown, so not listened. If you hear that he was testifying falsely, then that that still doesn't count. He has to be shown it visually. What? Someone can send him that, the YouTube. I'm just, I'm just saying how Flake's going to get out of it. Like it depends on wh- he what the criteria actually for said shown that. is. He hasn't actually said that. Well, that's what he took out of the 60 Minutes guys. Yeah, I like the way you're thinking. Wait a there. second. Wait a second. If it's shown that he was lying, like Jeff Flake's just going to say, I, "It didn't meet my criteria for what shown to be lying." Is. Right. Well, yeah, of course. But uh, maybe we'll see if that's a little bit different after today's show. Um, oh, folks. Blue Apron has a mission. It's to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. You can make dinner now in as little as 20 minutes. They've got quick and easy recipe options that are perfectly proportioned uh, with ingredients delivered right to your door. No meal planning or shopping required. Whether you're looking for a quick and easy meal or a full culinary experience, Blue Apron lets you choose from a range of recipe options. This is nice. I like this newer version. I don't. I mean, I hate to say it, I just don't have the time uh, to cook. So if I can get it down 20 minutes, bingo. Get out of your cooking rut and experience the joy of new recipes. Talk about, um, I can tell you, one of the things that, I mean, you talk about like convenience and satiating that guilt you have as a parent where you're like, oh, God, I don't want to just get t- uh, take out food or frozen dinner for them again. But I also, frankly, I'm not going to spend an hour and a half cooking a meal. Forgive me. What are you going to do? I have um, things to read on the Internet. Well, I got to do work. Stir-fried sweet chili chicken, seared steaks, homemade steak sauce, homemade steak sauce. And these were amazing. Seared beef, dumplings, and jasmine rice. Wow. I can go for that right this second. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free. Why wouldn't you get why wouldn't you why wouldn't anybody do this? You get three meals free. They send it to your house. You get you can choose each week how many you're gonna get. Blueapron.com slash majority. That's blueapron.com slash majority. Get your first three meals free. Blue apron, a better way to cook. I'm gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Nathan Robinson. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Nathan J. Robinson. He is the editor of Current Affairs uh, magazine at currentaffairs.org. Uh, Nathan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Nice to be with you, Sam. Okay, so uh, your piece has gotten a lot of people have cited it as uh, being the sort of the most comprehensive um, uh, piece on the the many myriad of uh of lies and ways judge Kavanaugh lied during mm-hmm. his hearing and uh we just played a clip from Jeff Flake and Chris Coons uh from 60 mm-hmm. minutes when they were asked if it was shown that Kavanaugh lied during the hearing would that be enough to disqualify him and they said yes. They didn't say specifically shown about lying what or uh, about what 
or um, or what shown means, right? <laughs> um, but right. Uh, I suggest that uh, maybe people start sending your piece to them, uh, or they can just yeah. listen to the show if they don't want to have to uh, if they can't read. Um, but so, I think whatever definition of shown you adopt, I think I made it somewhere in the eleven thousand words of that article. Um, well, let's let's um, let's go through some of these, um, and we you 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 basically just walk through. Um, Without making an assessment of what Ford says, just judging or I guess assessing what a Kavanaugh says. So uh, you start right. with a Kavanaugh's denial, and this is the first one that you cite. I never attended a gathering like the one Dr. Ford describes in her allegation. Now, uh, Please address that for us. And, and to some extent, it's sort of a shame. It feels like the Democrats either didn't have the information long enough beforehand, which is very possible, or they just didn't do enough in researching this stuff to push back. But we have the 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 uh, yeah. I guess the, the the value of hindsight. But go ahead. Well, walk us through that. Well, I mean, I, I do think you no, know, I, I think they had a lot of information and didn't use it well. There was plenty of stuff that was just just in plain sight. Um, but yeah, so the gathering uh, lie. He says, "I never attended a gathering like the one Miss Ford described." And there's this sort of uh, efforts to hint that it was like this that she's describing this kind of big bacchanalian party, like a toga party or something, like this crazy party that everyone would have remembered. But actually, it, her, her testimony, she says that she's been misrepresented in the press because it wasn't a large party. It was a small gathering with friends in Bethesda with a, over a few drinks. Now, Kavanaugh, of course, attended small gatherings in Bethesda over a few drinks. I mean, when he says he didn't attend a gathering like this, I mean, I'm sure he attended lots of gatherings like this. Um, but then he also goes on to specify and say, I didn't attend a gathering I also didn't attend the gathering with any of the people, uh, with, with the group of people that, that uh, Christine Blasey Ford says were at this gathering. Um, and that is just directly contradicted by the calendar that he provided to exonerate himself. Yeah, I mean, he, he mentions specifically the, that July 1st entry involves six people, mm -hmm. four of whom were ones that she said was at a party very similar to that. Well, yeah, she named, she said that she remembered uh, four boys, Brett, PJ, Mark Judge, and one whose name she couldn't remember. And on the July 1st entry, July 1st, summer 1982, Brett Kavanaugh says he's going for drinks uh, uh, over to Timmy's with, uh, with uh, Mark Judge, PJ, and a couple of other boys. Um, so the group, when he tries to say, you know, these weren't my people, right, he started naming other people that he did hang out with over the summer. And he didn't mention the fact that when she said Mark and PJ, those were his friends. He did go to gatherings with them. Um, so it, he, he, the interesting thing here is not is that he also buried that information, right? He tried, he tried deliberately to direct the Senate's attention away from this event by pointing to weekends. He does this fascinating thing where he goes, well, presumably the event she's describing happened on a weekend, and I was usually out of town on the weekend. But the third, this, this July 1st gathering is on a Thursday, so you can see why he wants to push you towards the weekend. Now, I, we should also say that on the first, there's another guy there, Squee, who is Chris mm. Garrett. And Chris Garrett was had the uh, a great misfortune of being the evil doppelganger in Ed Whelan's um, uh, fevered uh, conspiracy. But he also, in real life, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, the one that Ford said, we uh, uh, introduced me to Kavanaugh. Yes. Yeah, she says that uh, Chris Garrett, Chris Squee Garrett, um, they went out a couple of times 
um, and that, yeah, he was her connection to Kavanaugh. And we know that Kavanaugh knew Chris because he's on the calendar. Uh, so we know he knew Chris Garrett. Now, Chris Garrett, I don't think there's many public statements about whether he knew Christine Ford. I don't know whether he's backed up or denied uh, what she says. Um, but that would be a connection. Brett Kavanaugh said they didn't move in the same social circles. I mean, Kavanaugh's testimony essentially tries to suggest that she's to- like she's totally off base. She was like at a different school on the other side of town, and we didn't move in the same circles. I never saw this woman. She and and actually, it's the the circles that they moved in turn out to be much much closer than what he described in his testimony. It would be an unbelievable coincidence that this woman had created this fiction about these people who all just happened to be good buddies of Kavanaugh's. And he just like out of whole cloth, like she would have come up with this, right? Like, how could she possibly know that Judge and Kavanaugh were such good friends if she didn't know them? If, right, if he did. And she said that she said um, that she was at this thing with the uh, judge and PJ before he released the calendars, confirming it. Uh, and the other thing is that her account is corroborated by Mark Judge's memoir, because she said uh, in her testimony that six weeks, six to eight weeks later, she ran into Mark Judge, and he looked very embarrassed, and he didn't want to talk to her. And she ran into him at his job at the supermarket. And in Mark Judge's memoir, he says that late, late in that summer, he was working at the supermarket. So <laughs> um, there are details that do add up. People say there's no corroboration. I mean, you know, it depends what you consider corroboration. But there are reasons to believe that, uh, um, she, I mean, she's definitely not as Kavanaugh portrayed her. He wanted to suggest that all of this was just totally, totally crazy. I mean, to me... The Chris interviewing Chris Garrett has always struck me uh, to be the, the most important uh, person mm-hmm. they could interview. I mean, obviously, Judge, but Judge right. is going to get up there and live. It, it, it strikes me mm-hmm. as Chris Garrett would have a very tough time lying about the fact that he knew that they knew each other. Right. That right. that that like, I mean. All it would take is him to say, no, I did. I introduced him to Kavanaugh. Of course she knew Kavanaugh. Of course Kavanaugh knew her. And that's the end of the game right there. I mean, that's the, the, it seems to me. No, it's crucial. What's he going to say? I mean, if if he says, no, me and Ford, me and Christy Ford never went out, well, that really hurts, you know, what she's saying. But if he says, yeah, she's completely correct about that, then that really does make out a case for Kavanaugh. I mean, we've already made out the case that Kavanaugh lied under oath a bunch of times. You don't need to do it more times. uh, I stress in this article that the investigation is almost unnecessary at this point, just because from the testimony itself, you have so many damning things. Well, I want to talk about uh, we'll we'll get to the investigation in a moment to the extent that there is one, uh, because, you know, it's pretty (laughs) arguable that there is not one. Uh, even not even an inquiry. And and we will get there. But let's go through a couple of these key uh, moments. So he lied about never being at a party like the one she talks about. Um, In fact, Mm -hmm. uh, he also later admitted he was at a party almost exactly like the one that she talked about, as defined by the people and the location and the sort of offhand. Do we have a sense, though, his argument is like, oh, we would... We would go to Tobin's house and work out. I, wh- what is your sense? I know you don't really touch on in the piece. I'm just curious. Like, there's something weird about the Tobin's house workouts. Because he also, during his testimony, <laughs> well, he got super emotional about about those workouts. Well, he got emotional about a lot of things in that testimony. He, when he started talking about his calendars, he started weeping, which was very, very odd. Well, no, I thought um, that was okay because it was. It reminded him of his dad, and he was doing it because he wanted to be like his dad. And then, he, you know, I, I don't have that kind of relationship. I, I, but. I brought that when I thought. I thought initially when I saw that that his father was deceased, um, right. and he was reminiscing. But his father was in the room. <laughs> well, maybe he was upset that he had to have his dad hear about how he uh, hear his. You know, have his dad watch him lie yeah. about this. I, but, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what to make of the workouts. I, I'm, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be really, really cautious about not speculating. You know, people have emailed me a ton of stuff where they like, and what about this additional thing? I'm like, yeah, it is fishy and strange. I mean, the whole calendar thing is strange to begin with, like keeping these meticulous calendars. But 
you know, I'm trying to have actually, even though I come to a very strong conclusion, I'm trying to produce a really conservative case. All right, so fair enough. I'm I, not I, arguing. Yeah. All right, I'll respect yeah. that and won't make you go to places where I where I'm going. Um, so it says here, uh, uh, at one point, uh, Kavanaugh said all the witnesses who were there that day say it didn't happen. Ms. Kaiser, this is, uh, Leland, uh, Kaiser. This is, uh, Ford's friend. This is really, I mean, amazing how many fr- friends, uh, well, okay. Well, Kavanaugh didn't say, uh, Ms. Kaiser, her longtime friend said she never saw me at a party with or without Dr. Ford. Uh, the only problem is that Ms. Kaiser never said that. In fact, none of the people right. gave the denial that uh, that Kavanaugh claimed they did. Just tease that out for us. Yeah, Mark Judge kind of did. His first statement didn't, and his second statement said, well, I've never seen Brett Kavanaugh do anything like this, which does suggest that it didn't happen. But um, TJ's statement just says, I have no knowledge of this. And I have no knowledge. It's very important. He, Kavanaugh conflated them because he thought people w- wouldn't notice. But I have no knowledge of the thing is not the same as I have knowledge that the thing is false. Um, and, and that's really important because I might not know about something, and it might still be true. Um, and so Leland, Leland Kaiser is, is interesting because this is egregious, right? Brett Kavanaugh goes in front of the Senate and he says, and he emphasizes over and over, I, I collected the clips and it's about five times he says, all of the people say it didn't happen. And then he cites a couple of times he says, Ms. Kaiser, she says it didn't happen. She's the best friend. If she says it, then there's nothing. And, you know, Ford must be crazy, essentially, is the implication. But Ford thinks it did happen. Ford says she, be- she told the Washington Post that she believes Christine Ford, which means that she actually thinks the opposite of what Kavanaugh said she thinks. So, I mean, I, I just think that's his blame. He knew that. He knows what <laughs> He's citing what she said, he, but he's, he's, he's just citing the opposite because he thinks he can fool people. Um, so it's just false. He just told a falsehood. Um, that's another one we'll chalk up uh, for his lying. No, I mean, I don't know. I guess how important do you think not lying to the Senate is to be a justice of the Supreme Court? Just, I mean. Uh... I, I, I say pretty important. <laughs> I mean, the whole the whole thing, the whole mythology of the court is the sanctity of the rule of law and oaths of office and the, the, the dignity of the United States government. I mean, if if you just go before the Senate and you just treat the oath of your your oath with total contempt, um, that it should disqualify you not just from being on the Supreme Court, but probably from holding any major government office ever again. Um, let's talk about the country club. There was a real sense, according to Kavanaugh, that like, and I think even the prosecutor was trying to make it like the country club, the, you know, the, the, was sort of, everybody was untethered from the country club in some fashion, but that's not exactly the case either, is it? No, we haven't met. Look, the thing, Brett Kavanaugh tried to suggest again that everything was so far apart, we never moved in the same circle. Um, but... When he looked at it, and he said, you know, the country club is not near where I lived. So, and and uh, Christine Ford said she was at the country club that day. Um, he said, well, that's not where I lived. Well, Bethesda is actually a pretty small, it's about five miles across. I don't know, that's a rough estimate. Um, it's small. <laughs> and, and there was a map presented in the Senate that showed where they all lived, and they all lived within a few miles of each other. And Ford, uh, and I think Kavanaugh actually lived closer to the country club than Ford did. So... Uh, I mean, he's again, he's just trying to create an impression that if you actually look into, if you look at a map, you can instantly see is completely false. Also, by the way, one of my favorite facts is that his father and Christine Ford's father were members of the same golf club. So (laughs) that's the same circle. They came, they both were at like D.C. elite schools. Um, So they're very, very close ties here. And they're all making it out like these are huge distances. But, I mean, these are all like you can ride your bike in 20 minutes to any of these places. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, the idea that uh, Kevin was not a big drinker in high school. I mean, I know he liked beer. Ah, uh, the alcohol. Yeah. I mean, he likes beer. 
the first thing the first thing I want to mention is why it's important. Because there was a lot of the Republicans like to say, "Well, you oh, you're examining his high school yearbook for evidence that he drank." This is ridiculous. Look at you, you know. Oh, he drank, and that matters. Um, it actually matters quite a lot because all three sexual uh, misconduct allegations against him say that he was heavily drinking and that involved alcohol. And Brett Kavanaugh's defense when he got up there and he was asked, or when he got up there and he gave the reasons why you should believe him, he said, I wasn't this person. I was not the person they're describing me as, this horrible, you know, belligerent, uh, drunken frat bro. I was studious. I went to church. I volunteered at the soup kitchen. Um, he, he, I, 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 was, I was a good kid. And so... That's imp- that makes it important, and if it's, if it's false, if it turns out that all of that is completely false, which it is, um, then that both, number one, is, again, perjury, but also affects his credibility on the, uh, on the accusation itself. Right. This goes to the uh, Blumenthal's uh, Latin saying, false in one mm-hmm. thing, false in all things, uh, yeah. which, which is evidence that judges give to juries um, to in in, uh, in regards to witnesses who have testified. Um, let's just go through some of the evidence that he's more than just an ordinary social oh, drinker. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I, you know, I keep finding more evidence. I just, I like literally five minutes before we got on this, uh, we started this interview, I just found a Yale Daily News article that said he ran weekly tailgate parties during his time at Yale. He hosted them uh, every week. So you just keep finding more stuff. Uh, and, and, a new, and a new person came out yesterday who was at Yale with him and, said, and actually recounted a violent incident in which he threw a beer in a guy's face and started a fight. Uh, but you just have so, so many quotes. I mean, from really distinguished alumni of, of Yale, people like, you know, you're the head of uh, uh, gynecological oncology at the University of Washington came out and said, I used to booze with Brett all the time in college, and he's full of it. <laughs> you had freshman year roommate. You know, the New York Times talked to a dozen people. Um, the yearbook is full of references. To, he literally has... A uh, hundred kegs or bust on his yearbook page, right? This is just such a ridiculous picture for him to try to paint because it's so contradicted by so many people who knew him. So, I mean, um, just because he was the treasurer of the Keg City Club, do you think that means that he likes to drink a lot, or is he is he like to maybe just he likes to handle money? Well, we don't know, because one, this is one thing that, that they never asked him. The yep. word keg does not appear in the transcript of the hearing, which is kind of shocking, because to me, like, the, the Mark Judge said, I think in his memoir, that they had a, a contest to try and get to 100 kegs in one school year, to go through 100 kegs. And Brett Kavanaugh has it on his, has it on his yearbook page. So you think if you were examining the, the, the alcohol-related facts, that would be something to mention, but they didn't ask about it, so we don't know much about the Keg City Club. Um, uh, White House asked him about his um, his, and I didn't catch until I read your piece that it wasn't just um, it was it didn't just say mention that he Ralphed a lot, but it, it was specifically tied into the Beach Week Ralph Club. Yes, as if yeah, like, yeah. his stomach was only upset at Beach Week. Because presumably yeah. this food is spicy on Beach Week. Yeah, so it's fine. They go, yeah, they go to <laughs> oh, beaches in Thailand. And, you know, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just ridiculous, right? Because he's asked about the Beach Week, Ralph. I mean, if you watch, watch the exchanges, because they're hilarious. Because he's asked, I think, by Sheldon Whitehouse. Um, he says, well, could you explain what Ralphing means in the Beach Week Ralph Club? And he says, no, oh, it, it, it is vomiting, but I have a very sensitive stomach. Everyone knows that. And Sheldon Whitehouse says, okay, but was it also alcohol-related? And Carador says, ah, uh, do you like beer? I like beer. <laughs> That's what he says. He doesn't answer the question. Uh, he says, uh, in fact, he says, quote, that probably refers to throwing up, probably. 
I'm known to have a weak stomach, and I always have. In fact, the last time I was there, you asked me about having ketchup on spaghetti. I always had a weak stomach. This is well known. Anyone who knows me, uh, a lot of these people behind me, they know me all my whole life. You know, you know, I got a weak stomach, whether it's with beer or spicy food or anything. <laughs> I remember what he says in response to the next follow up is he says <laughs> something like Senator, I yes, went to okay. Yale. Yeah, here it goes. So the vomiting this you reference at the Ralph Club uh, reference related to the consumption of alcohol. Senator, I was at the top of my class academically, busted my butt in school. <laughs> Be captain of varsity basketball team. Got into Yale College. When I got into Yale College, got into Yale Law School, worked my tail off. <laughs> so I was was it alcohol related? And so I went to Yale, and you go, well, what does that mean? And, you know, people not drink a lot of alcohol at Yale, or no alcoholics at Yale. George W. Bush went to Yale, for God's sake. I mean, and then White it's House just such an odd deflection. White House goes, did it relate to alcohol? You haven't answered that. Kavanaugh yeah. says, I like beer. I like beer. I don't know if you do. <laughs> White House says, okay, do you like beer, Senator, or not? You know, when you read this stuff, like, you know, we watched it in the context of like hour three and a half. You're just like, uh. Mm -hmm. But when you see it isolated like this, it's nuts. It's like a conversation. If, 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 If we turn this into like, you know, gummy worms. And uh, there was some missing from the cabinet. And I asked my five year old son, like, did you have gummy worms? And he goes, Billy was mean to me today at school. I'm not asking you that. Did yeah. you have gummy worms? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you can't believe that the Senate failed to pin him down on some of this stuff because he was just, I mean, he wasn't answering anything. He was doing this. And it's just, it was just the whole way through he was doing this. Um, and the thing is, it seems like it's a, a, a way of trying to avoid having to tell a lie, but he also told a bunch of outright lies, so I don't even see what he was doing. The thing is that you can think about the fact that uh, he could have constructed a far more plausible explanation. He could have just said, when I was young, I was a jock, and I drank a lot. (laughs) I used to drink, I used to party, I used to love it. I recovered, and now I'm, I'm a judge, and people should appreciate that. But instead, he just constructed this totally fictitious story. And, and I won't ask you to speculate why someone might do that if they felt, um, but I think a lot of people can say, like, well, I guess if I knew I was a blackout drunk in high school and in college, um, conceding that might concede that I might not be the best witness as to yeah. uh, what I did or did not do in certain situations. But yeah. this yeah. one, it, it could be very harmful. The, the Renate, but... <laughs> the, the Renate one, let's talk about this because. Oh I... yes. Let's talk about that because that's an interesting example of uh, something that really he could have just said, sorry for, <laughs> And did not. <laughs> Instead, doubled down repeatedly. Well, I mean, just so, just lay it out for folks, because this is the... Yeah. When, when I've talked about it over the weekend, this is the moment that I find, in some ways, the most stunning, in some ways. But go ahead. Yeah, I agree with you. And it seems like a small one, but I think it's a really big one. Which is, uh, so they knew, all the, all the guys on the football team knew this girl named uh, Renate or Renate, uh, and... Uh, she, uh, in their yearbook, and, and one, a couple of the Georgetown prep students have given quotes to the New York Times saying that they, they, the football players had really disgusting things about her, and they all used to like pretend that they'd gotten with her and have real innuendos about her. Um, and indeed, in the yearbook, they all list themselves as like re- members of the Renate Alumni Club. Um, they have a caption, and Brett Kavanaugh has it on his page, too. And... And so when she found out about this, she actually initially signed the letter in support of him. But when she found out that she had never known that this was in the yearbook, and when it was presented to her, she said she was horrified. She couldn't believe that they would have done that to her. She was really hurt. Um, And yet Kavanaugh, instead of admitting that they were really hurtful to this girl in high school, um, said, oh, no, 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 it had nothing to do with sexual bragging, and it couldn't have because I never actually had any inter- sexual interaction with her. That was his argument. 
Um, so uh, it, he said it was just a tribute to a dear friend. And this media circus is turning this sick. And then he posed as her defender and he said, and you're bringing up this, dragging this woman's name through. Shame on you. <laughs> right. And the thing is, they, he was really despicable to this girl in high school. And now it's like lying about it and pretending it's just such an awful thing to do. And there's also confirmation that it was about uh, sex because elsewhere in the yearbook there's a little poem that's impossible to mistake for anything else in it named her. Well, what's, uh, well, there were two things that were interesting about this. One, his lawyer had put out a different uh, statement about this than he did, right? That, uh, mm-hmm. Which I was surprised that did not come up. But also, this is one of those moments where, you know, all the other stuff, you know, you need to sort of like, like think about it for a half a second. This is one, the mm-hmm. one instance where it occurs to me like every single person in that room, his wife, his mom, his dad, all of his supporters, all of his detractors, every single one of those senators, the prosecutor. Uh, people holding microphones. Every single person in that room knew that he was lying about this. And yeah, no right. one said a word. No, I know. <laughs> it, it's startling. Well, you know, I mean, it's very telling to me when he, he gave a speech a couple of years ago where he said, what happens at Georgetown Prep stays at Georgetown Prep, and that's a good thing. And I think what you're seeing here is the kind of wagon circling, protecting their own thing that elites do, like the, the Yale Club usually does. I mean, I mean for, it, it's not really working for Brett Kavanaugh because we have like a list of Yale alumni who are all saying he's lying. But, um, yeah, you can see that the Georgetown prep people are like, you know, maybe they know inside that he's lying, but nobody, nobody says anything because you don't say things about a fellow whatever but it also it also struck me just even the people who were not supporters of him like you know everybody there mm-hmm. knew he was lying and it was just amazing to me that, that that nobody said come on judge you're lying <laughs> we know yeah. you're lying you're lying about that yeah. and i don't know i thought that was pretty uh, crazy i mean there was the devil's triangle thing you know about it being a drinking game and you know i have to say like I, I cop to not knowing what Devil's Triangle was. No, I mean, so I had no idea of it either. But the, but the interesting thing is, if you watch the moment where he says it, it's really funny because there's a long pause, and so yeah, you know, I, I had friends who knew about this and who, and you know, who informed me that it has. I mean, it has a number of definitions. It's like the title of a King Crimson album, but it's not a drinking game. There's no drinking game. He just made that one up. And it's pretty clear that among fratty people, this is kind of what that they would be referring to the sexual definition of the word of the term. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, when if you watch the moment, it's really funny because Sheldon Whitehouse goes, Devil's Triangle, and Brett Kavanaugh goes, silence, silence, drinking game. And then White House instantly, uh, he, uh, he, he jumps on it, and he goes, uh, well, how's it played? And, and Kavanaugh goes, uh, three cups in a triangle. <laughs> do you think he, do you think, and this is my sense, that that was practiced? Like, that was not off the top of his head. They went through this, and they said, how are you going to explain this? Yeah. Yeah, they did practice this. What the devil's trying? What, what are you going to say when they say this? Yeah. What are you going to say with that? Which is interesting, because you'd think if he practiced a bunch, he wouldn't have perjured himself so much. You, <laughs> well, yes. And, and, and I mean, I, I, the moment I, I feel like I saw that practicing, like the, the narrowness of the practicing, was when Durbin changed it up and said, personally, do you feel that there should be an FBI investigation? Personally. And that's where he got stumped because he had practiced. Like, do you think there should be one? I'm willing to do whatever the committee says, but personally, yeah. And then he just sort of stood right. there and looked to Grassley, like, "Dude, aren't you supposed to jump in here?" I mean, it was 
um, really poor theater, obviously, to the extent that they ended up having to ask for this FBI inquiry. But give me your sense. All right. Step back for a moment. And you have mm-hmm. made this uh, very, I think, conservative, very literal, explicit, no speculation case about his lying. I mean, you lay it out there. Mm-hmm. This is it's it's basically a math equation. Step back mm-hmm. though, uh, and 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 be a prognosticator for a moment. Do you think okay. the nature of this FBI investigation, now that it's been revealed that only four people are being interviewed, PJ? Ramirez, this is the woman who made uh, the other claim about him at Yale, which, of course, can't be substantiated, right? Because you're not talking to anybody else at Yale. Um, right. Uh, Mark Judge and Leland Kaiser. Judge said he wants it only confidential. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Uh, but Leland Kaiser is there who um, apparently is uh, has some type of illness that, that Ford cited. Yeah. And may not want to get involved in this. And Ford basically gave her yeah. a pass at the um, right. at the hearing. So do you think, though, with the knowledge about that investigation, a. And this almost goes without saying, do you think the investigation is going to be sufficient? B. Will it be sufficient for its real purpose, which is to provide some type of cover for at least some of those senators? Yeah. Well, this is why I almost think it was a mistake for Democrats to spend so much of their time and energy in the hearings uh, calling for an FBI investigation, um, because I think it, it will allow for, whether it will work, I don't know, but it certainly is a way of going, well, the FBI ran an investigation, they talked to all the principal people, uh, nothing else came up, and so no more corroboration, let's put them on the court. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm worried, and I wish, I kind of wish the Democrats had said, well, let's not call him for the FBI, let's nail him in the hearings. We have one chance to get him, um, and we can't trust the FBI, because you can't. <laughs> so, I don't know what's going to come out of it, though. I have no idea. I, I, I have to say, I think the Democrats had to do that with the FBI, because there was no guarantee they would nail him in the committee. And doing the FBI thing was the one procedural thing where they could bring on board people like Manchin and Heitkamp who who couldn't afford to make a decision on politics, had to make one on process. Yeah. It, it's unfortunate, though, because uh, if it does come out and it's a whitewash, uh, it's going to it's going to be a problem. <laughs> But the, the only nice thing is that we have such compelling evidence that it, it does sort of totally discredit him on the Supreme Court. I mean, it's uh, as a political rallying point, I think it will decrease the popularity of the conservatives on the Supreme Court and will make it harder politically to, say, overturn Roe versus Wade if you have like this guy writing the opinion. Right. Indeed. Well, uh, uh, Nathan J. Robinson, uh, editor of... Uh, uh, current affairs folks can uh, we will link to this piece this is the thing that you pass around to i think probably um the vast majority of people you know who don't follow this stuff well and uh to so that they can have a very explicit like you say conservative no speculation just laying out the facts and just even reading again the uh, the transcripts in those key moments is just a bizarre experience. But uh, Nathan, say, thanks yeah. so much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Nice to be with you. Bye bye. All right, mm-hmm. folks, we're going to take a uh, quick break. Head into the fun half where we will take your phone calls and your IMs. Uh, go over a couple other pieces of sound. Let's. Um, let, here is. Let's do this before we go. Briefly. So uh, it, it came out over the weekend that the FBI, and I don't know how we know this. We kept hearing stories of the FBI not responding to people from Yale who were trying to get in touch with them to give them a statement from the woman who was Mark Judge's girlfriend Mark Judge had told her about his feeling guilty about getting a woman drunk in high school and then 
basically um, being part of a train where various men would have sex with her. But according to him, it was consensual. But he was feeling guilty. Um, the FBI is not interviewing her. The FBI is not interviewing Garrett. Just squee. Who could tell us about the relationship between Kavanaugh and Ford? If Kavanaugh was lying when he said he didn't know Ford because Squee was the one who interviewed, who introduced them, according to Ford. I mean, then we could we could wrap this whole thing up. All you need to do is ask, ask Garrett. Did you introduce Ford to Kavanaugh? Would you have you were friends with both? And if he says, I did not. Well, then all of a sudden, you know, that Blasey Ford is. This incredible fabulist. But if he says, yeah, of course I did. I was friends with Kavanaugh. I'd hang out with him with, you know, the cheesy and barbells or whatever those guys are. And we had squeeze and Skis. I went out with Ford. Of course, they would have known each other. Then, you know, Brett Kavanaugh just made a bald face lie. And you, you wonder why. So it comes out over the weekend that the FBI is not doing a thorough even inquiry because they are being limited by the White House. Then Donald Trump gets wind that this has been reported and leaked. And so he tweets out, no, the FBI can do whatever they want. But then the FBI, when asked by The Washington Post, no. Uh, we have not heard uh, we have not gotten a formal rescission from the first instructions from the White House. And therefore, we are going to limit our invest investigation. In fact, we may be done tomorrow. As in today or Tuesday. So. Jake Tapper. Interviews Amy Klobuchar about it. And I, I, I mean. Seriously, Jake Tapper. Are you confident? You just heard Kellyanne Conway say the FBI can investigate whatever they want to investigate. Do you, are you confident that the FBI will, will be able to explore everything they want to, in, including if they are interested, the Julie Swetnick allegations, including uh, whether or not uh, he was honest to the Senate Judiciary Committee about his drinking? Well, based on some of the reports uh, that we've seen this weekend, I'm very concerned about this because the White House should not be allowed to micromanage an FBI investigation. She says As they're not. Kellyanne, said, Kellyanne I, said they're not. I know. And there was one thing she did say, and that is that the hardworking men and women of the FBI should be able to do their jobs. And on that, I agree. But Is Jake Tapper really citing Kellyanne Conway's public uh, proclamation that the FBI is doing this as some type of refutation. First off, in terms of just the sheer authority, Kellyanne Conway has no more authority to tell the FBI to do anything than I do. And Kellyanne Conway's job has been from day one to lie on behalf of the president. (laughs) So if only Jake Tapper was in a position where he could marshal resources to go and ask the FBI this question to find out exactly what they're doing, instead of saying Kellyanne Conway, not once, but twice, as if he's serious. I mean, and I know in his mind, he's thinking, it's my job It's my job to push back on Klobuchar. She's a senator. She has power. It's my job to push back upon that in terms of what the White House is saying. Um, But the manner in which you do that reflects some notion of your sense of, of her credibility, right? Because we know Jake Tapper wouldn't say, Well, Sam Cedar said on his Twitter feed that the FBI is doing this. And that's because everybody would look around and go like, well, all right, I don't know Sam Cedar. But to the extent that I do, he that doesn't matter. And even though everybody knows who Kellyanne Conway is, and even though she works for the president, it doesn't matter. 
Thoughtful people know this. Jake Tapper's smart enough to know it doesn't matter what she says. So why is he pretending it does? Well, because I think journalists like to abdicate certain kinds of responsibility. That's why he likes to point to Mercatus. But Uh, my point is he's not abdicating responsibility. He would make the assessment if it was me. And I'm sorry. The... To then decide, like, I, it's too close of a call if she's being honest in this instance. He is making an assessment. He is not abdicating. That's my point. He's not abdicating. He's pretending he's abdicating, but he's not. He's actually saying this is a legitimate claim against what you've said. And he knows it's not a legitimate claim. So he's not abdicating. He's actually deciding to weigh in. It's just that he's deciding that by pretending to abdicate, he's abdicating. And he's not abdicating. He's making an assessment as to whether or not the claim is worthy. And he does that every time he puts it on. Like It is completely controversial, the question as to whether or not Kellyanne Conway is telling the truth here. Well, Particularly yeah. since the FBI has come out with reporting that they're not going to do it. That's the problem with the kind of journalism where you hold each side of a thing to be equally valid, right? Because in some cases, they're not. And it's your job as a journalist to go out and figure that out. Plus, there's not just two sides here. The FBI is another player, and the FBI has already pushed back on this notion. I think... The reason why the FBI has announced that they may be done today is a way to create pressure on the White House or on the senators to have a more extensive investigation. Because I can tell you, my daughter took a uh, she took an uh, you know like a high school assessment. Public high school in New York is a nightmare to get into, and she had ninety minutes. And she came out after an hour. And my immediate reaction is, what did you do? You're not done. You didn't do a very good job. You got to get back in there. It was easy. Uh, Then take the extra 30 minutes. Double check your work. She announces, I'm coming out. You know, after 10 minutes, my hair's on fire. And I think that's what, I think why the, I think that's why the FBI came out with that. I think to basically say like, to just indicate everybody, yeah, this ain't for reals. All right, we got to take a quick break, head into the fun half. Just a reminder, this show relies on you. It's daily listeners or twice daily listeners, weekly, twice weekly listeners or thrice weekly listeners for its support. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Keeps this lovely studio, the lights on behind us and above us and the electricity that's involved in this microphone and... Um, This, even this, this little marker that I use to point at that, that's all of that and more. Uh, Join the majority report dot com. Also, just coffee dot co-op, fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10 percent off. We just ordered a five pound bag of the majority report blend. That's the way we roll around here. Uh, Tomorrow it's Tuesday. Michael, what will happen Tuesday evening? Daniel Besner will join us to talk about his recent New York Times op-ed on a left-wing foreign policy and what that means. And uh, we'll do a little bit of a sort of condensed history of foreign policy defense intellectuals. And we're also talking about why the new environmental uh, refugees are rich, that and much more. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Jamie? All right. So this weekend we recorded a new episode with guest Molly Crabapple. We talked a lot about Puerto Rico, disaster relief, um, prefigurative politics, mutual aid, all the cool things people have been doing there to help each other survive and rebuild after the hurricane. And um, we also talk a little bit about uh, sex work, sex workers' rights, Sesta Fosta, stuff like that. So that should be out uh, Wednesday. And we, we still have our conspiracy theories episode up as well. We may uh, uh, touch on this in the fun half. We're going to find out more about what's going on with NAFTA. But uh, apparently this may in some ways be a back end around uh, parts of uh, uh, SESTA-FOSTA. 
because of uh, Section 203, apparently. Of we'll NAFTA. See. Because of this deal between uh, Canada and the U.S., they the uh, Facebooks and the the and, and whatnot put in a provision that would make them less responsible for what is posted by users. In which case, that could undercut SESTA and FOSTA. Good outcome, bad dynamic, where we lose uh, the ability to maintain a bill, you know, a control over our own uh, laws and corporations can do end runs around these things. But huh. uh, we'll talk more about that in the fun half because that's so fun. Uh, Matt. Uh, yeah, Literary Hangover. I'm still doing my reading of Hope Leslie for patron members. Uh, if you're not a member, you can check out the YouTube page. I'm at 970 subscribers, so I want to get to 1,000. What's up with the hat? I'm just wearing hats now. Yeah, but why that one? Oh, it's what? a Boston thing. He's upset about that. I'm, a anti, I'm so anti-JD uh, Martinez that I'm a Yankee <laughs> fan now. We're going to take a quick break. Head into the fun half. Uh, 646 We'll put on the IM. See you in the fun half. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous. You're a little bit uh, upset. You're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. Do. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly.